God would come down right now. Terry, what can I do for you? Send me and put me back in one Super Bowl and put me on the one foot line and give me two minutes to go and give me all three of my timeouts and give me my boys and then let me hear my name over the loudspeaker. Let me hear the roar of the crowd. Brad, John, Brad. Let me have them booing on one side. Let me get in and call plays, see the eyes grow as I call these plays, and talk to them. Let me feel the hair on my back crawl up. I mean, that's what the Super Bowl does to you. I mean, it's, I mean, it's doing it right now to me. I mean, I could go out right now and play. I know I can play two minutes. 25 years have passed since the Green Bay Packers first took the Coliseum field in Super Bowl I. Ever since, Teams have launched campaigns in the hopes of competing in what has become the ultimate contest. Throughout the years, football's showcase event has become a larger-than-life spectacle, dominated by its greatest teams and its greatest stars. celebration of the silver anniversary, a Super Bowl all-time all-star team has been assembled. The best of the best, 26 players, all genuine legends, and one immortal head coach, the Super Bowl dream team. Throughout the storied history of 25 years of Super Bowls, running backs have often been central characters. Against the Chiefs, Packer Hall of Famer Jim Taylor scored the first rushing touchdown in Super Bowl history. Buffalo's Thurman Thomas scored the last touchdown 25 years later in the Super Bowl's silver anniversary game. Big hole right side, Thurman Thomas up near the 20 yard, still on his feet, 15, he'll score! And in between, there have been many stellar performances. In Super Bowl 19, Roger Craig became the first back to score three times in one Super Bowl. The longest Super Bowl run, a 74-yarder, was turned in by Raider Marcus Allen. Bucket giving to Allen, sending him wide left. He has to reverse his field, but he, and he gets away for a moment. Comes back up the middle of 30, 25, 40. Right past two men at the 50, down to the 40. Picking up a blocker to the 20, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Raiders! Oh, Toledo! In Super Bowl 22, the Hogs unleashed Timmy Smith in a record 204-yard performance. Horse race to the 40, far side 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. But it was another Redskin, John Riggins, who wrote the Super Bowl's most dramatic chapter. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. Here comes with John Riggins right up the middle. Right up over the middle. Shot! Yellow 41! Yellow 41! Hunt! Hunt! There's the snap, and the Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone! The 35! The 35! There can be no argument with the fan selection for the Super Bowl Dream Team all-time running backs. One is Miami's raging bull, the wrecking ball, Larry Zonka. The other, Pittsburgh's clutch big game back, Franco Harris. Franco uh, really showed us that we could win because before Franco, we did not win. Larry Zonka gave us that tremendous uh, physical, uh, the feeling of being more powerful than the people that we were playing against. 
All you had to do is look at Sanka and you got that feeling because this was a powerful man. He liked a little bit of blood dripping off his nose. He liked to look down and see himself filthy dirty because he now knows that he's playing the game, he's into it. Zonko was a barroom brawler of a runner who'd take on anyone anywhere. Franco was only an inch shorter and 10 pounds lighter. But he was a thoroughbred, not a workhorse. And he selected his battles carefully. What makes things special? Is every day the same? Is every day Christmas? Is every day Easter? No, no it's not. So when someone tells me that uh, uh, the middle of the season, regular season game is the same with the championship game. Not to me it isn't. In the big game, there was no one better than Franco. No one. I mean, he just, I mean, he lived for them. Franco would pace furiously. I mean, he would, he'd be in the locker room. It's like, it's like a boxer almost. He was like, he was in there, he'd, he'd just go back and forth. His body would start twitching. And he wouldn't say a whole lot. He'd be walking back and forth. And he'd get this real determined pace. The pace would turn into a stride. He'd go back and forth. And he'd walk by you. His eyes would just open up. He'd just look at you and he'd go, go ahead and do it today, right? Let's go get him some Come on, play great, play great. And then he'd keep going. That's all. And he'd, he'd get in that ball game, and he'd do it. Unlike Harris, the Zonk didn't raise his intensity to match the magnitude of the event. He always played the same uncompromising way. In Super Bowl VII, he rushed for 112 yards. He was a broken-nosed throwback who thrived on impact. I liked that style. I won't hide that. I, uh, I preferred to run inside, and it was kind of fun to meet head-on. When I won, it was very rewarding. When all else fails, and it's obvious that it's going to come down to a direct physical confrontation, I always thought it reflected a higher degree of intelligence to do the inflicting first. In back-to-back -back Super Bowl wins, Bob Greasy threw only 18 times. Larry Zonka was the weapon of choice. And in Super Bowl VIII, he was chosen the most valuable player. Zonka pounded out a record 145 yards as Minnesota was overrun 24-7. A year later, Harris broke Zonka's single-game Super Bowl record by rushing for 158 yards, carrying the Steelers to their first world championship. On the field, Franco was all fullback. Off it, he was a trusted friend. There was even a softer side to rock hard number 39. As a football coach, it's, it's tough to get attached to somebody uh, on a personal basis, but uh, it's tough not to get attached to a guy like Larry Zonka. To know him is to love him. The guy is a guy with a great sense of humor, very intelligent, and on game day, uh, one of the toughest football players that I've ever been around. In three Super Bowl appearances, Larry Zonka rushed for 297 yards, the second highest total in Super Bowl history. The record is 354, held, of course, by Franco, who played in four. Terry Bradshaw giving the ball to Franco through the middle, and over the 15 to 10, the 5, touchdown Pittsburgh. They opened it up down the middle, and the big guy went straight ahead through the hole. He knocked them loose in every direction. How about that one? Super Bowl 14 was Harris's last. He scored Pittsburgh's first touchdown. Time running out. They can then, with victory at stake, here, the game will be put out of reach by the He answered the call one final time. Harris slices off the left side for a touchdown. Franco Harris slicing off the left side. The Pittsburgh Steelers are the champions for the second straight year. When a challenge had to be met, and I asked myself, you know, did I meet it? And when you do, you feel good about it. Larry Zonka and Franco Harris. 
the all-time Super Bowl Dream Team running backs. No defense has dominated pro football like the Pittsburgh Steelers defense of the 1970s. In the six years from 1974 through 1979, the Steelers won four Super Bowls. The foundation was defense. <laughs> Six members of the Super Bowl Dream Team defense come from the Steel City. Their names are familiar. Joe Green, Elsie Greenwood, Jack Ham, Donnie Shell, Mel Blunt, Jack Lambert. And their deeds are imposing. It was Lambert who changed the face of the Steeler defense when he arrived in 1974. Tight end left! Tight end off! Robert, get ready to beat a Mike Backer! Double wing right! Ace! Jack Lambert, without question, was a catalyst. Uh, he was the guy that turned us from a very good football team and defensive team to a great defensive team very inspirational player, a tough player. There, there just are no other Jack Lamberts. I've never seen anyone like him. And without Jack Lambert, I'm not sure we'd have ever quite made it over the hump. Lambert weighed but 205 pounds, unheard of for a middle linebacker. Yet he was the unshakable force that drove the NFL's best defense. Jack Lambert is a misunderstood athlete. A lot of people think that Jack Lambert was a great player because he was rough and tough. But that's not why he was great. He was great because of his speed. He was great because of his intelligence. He never made a mistake. He was like one of those letter-perfect players on a football field. Ace it! Ace it! Ace it! Very good against the run, and against the pass, he was exceptional. He was brilliant. Did things that no other middle linebacker, they didn't even ask the other middle linebackers to do what they asked Jack Lambert to do. That's what people don't understand. They never told Dick Butkus to cover the first back out on the weak side, because Dick wouldn't, I mean, he couldn't do it. And so Jack Lambert was doing things that, that, was re that were revolutionizing defenses. Super Bowl XIV, amidst the glitter of big play offense, it was the gritty Lambert who made the game's biggest play. It came in the fourth quarter with the game on the line and the Rams poised to take the lead. Paragamo back to pass, shoots it over the middle. Intercepted by the Steelers, Lambert at the 15, the 20. Lambert still on his feet, cutting to the middle of the field. And he's down at the 30-yard line. First interception of the game off the arm of Paragamo. And for Pittsburgh Steelers fans, it could not have come at a better time with 5.24 to go in the game. Four years earlier, Lambert was the main character in a morality play, NFL style. The Dallas Cowboys with a star on their helmet matched against the men in black, the Pittsburgh Steelers. America's team versus the men of steel, finesse versus power. A missed field goal set the chain of events in motion. The way you beat finesse is you just hammer it, you intimidate them. 
And because of the image of the Cowboys and the way they'd been, you know, their PR department done in Tex and them and all created the, the America's team. And then for Harris to come over and pet him like that, see, it all been built up all week long. That sent a message to him. We'll knock that star off your helmet, Jack. People felt that that got us playing better, and maybe it did. I mean, maybe I, I was concerned they're going to throw him out of the game. I said, Jack, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. You know, don't lose your cool because we need you. But, you know, maybe that's what excited and, and got that team rolling because after that we played superb defense and shut the Cowboys off. It was the Steelers' second Super Bowl championship. But it was their first, one year earlier, that elevated the defense to legendary proportions. Super Bowl IX. To this day, it remains the top defensive performance in the game's history. The steel curtain allowed only 119 total yards. The fewest ever on Super Sunday. Greenwood and Green were the leaders. They intimidated the Vikings, stalked Fran Tarkenton, and generally rendered the Minnesota offense useless. Green, who received more votes than any other defensive player on the Super Bowl Dream Team, recorded two turnovers. An interception and a fumble recovery deep in Steeler territory. The Vikings' only other scoring opportunity ended with a bang. The men of steel left the Vikings battered and bruised. They didn't simply stop them. They forced them to surrender. Early on in those first Super Bowl games, we felt that uh, the onus was on the defense to, you know, to set the stage, to set the tempo. An extraordinary standard was set in Super Bowl IX, yet it was only the beginning. Three more times, the Steel Curtain closed a Super Bowl victory. Were they fantastic? I mean, sometimes, I mean, they would set the tempo so much, and I'd be on the sidelines watching them, just, you know, just, how physical they were, what they did. Mel Blunt, Elsie Greenwood, Donnie Shell, Joe Green, Jack Ham, and Jack Lambert. The Super Steel Curtain, the defense of a generation. They are the versatile and the violent, six men who made the dream team defense as much for their brains as their brawn. Thinking men's tough guys who influence the outcome of every Super Bowl they ever played in. You could never take Ted Hendricks at face value, for he was a man of a thousand faces and just as many personalities. A player who was a blend of the wonderful and the weird. Very strange human. Very strange. Ted Hendricks was a big old six foot eight, 205 pound stork. He looked like a stork. This strange bird played for the Colts, Packers, and Raiders, and proved virtually unblockable for 15 seasons. You can overemphasize all this stuff, how crazy he was, but when it came down to you one-on-one -on -one blocking Ted Hendricks, there was nobody like it. You would not block him if he didn't want you to, and that was all fundamental. In pro football's biggest game, Hendricks did all the little things well, like stuffing the Vikings running game in Super Bowl XI and pursuing and punishing the Eagles in Super Bowl XV. As a Baltimore Colt in Super Bowl V, the Stork used his height and reach to obscure the vision of the Cowboys' Craig Morton. 
The result was a crucial interception that led directly to victory in the final five seconds. In Super Bowl 15, this giant rose up to dwarf a certain eagle score. And once again, the Raiders triumphed 27 to 10. While dramatic plays were the hallmark of Ted Hendricks and the Raiders in three Super Bowl victories, safety Willie Wood of the Packers made the tide-turning play in the first Super Bowl. Wood's interception and brilliant return in the third quarter turned a tight game with the Kansas City Chiefs into a 35-10 rout. While Wood was one of four Hall of Famers on the Packer defense, arguably the best and brightest defense in pro football history were the 85 Chicago Bears led by cerebral middle linebacker Mike Singletary. Singletary brings an intensity to the game that probably no other defensive player has ever brought. He's such a student of the game, he spends so much time preparing. In the first minute of Super Bowl XX, Mike Singletary made the pivotal play. Sometimes the narrowest margin alters forever the emotional pitch of battle. And by just a fingertip, Singletary turned a short touchdown into an incompletion and set in motion the most devastating defensive onslaught in Super Bowl history. Like Singletary, Ronnie Lott's career is a tribute to his tenacity and perseverance. This is a guy who utterly refuses to lose. He does not understand the concept of giving up. He does not understand the concept of defeat. Lott plays so hard and with such fury that wide receivers cringe at the thought of trespassing into his territory. He has become an all-time great, not just on talent alone, but with a high degree of concentration that carries him above the level of his ability. It was this level of concentration that carried number 42 to the Bengals' Pete Johnson on fourth and goal in Super Bowl 16. The valiant goal line stand lifted the 49ers to the first of four Super Bowl victories in the 80s. Seven years later, Lott's ability to inspire was vividly documented against the Bengals once again. 78 angle exit! 78 angle exit! 28 Baker Bruce! The Cincinnati running game was dominating our play at that time. And uh, Ricky Woods, each time he'd get the ball, it seemed that he was getting stronger. You could, you could sense that. I was in the press box, and you could sense him taking over the ball game. If you watch all the films prior to that game, it was one free safety that had came up and hit Icky Woods straight up. It was like, you know, Ronnie Lott to the rescue. I mean, how many times has the man done this in his career? But his hit set the tempo for the rest of our defense. While the booming hits of Ronnie Lott propelled the 49ers to four world championships, the Dallas Cowboys have made a record five Super Bowl appearances, thanks to the looming specters of Randy White and Ed Tall Jones. In two Super Bowls against the Steelers, the Cowboys lost the wars, but Too Tall won all his battles. Number 72 smothered dream team running back Franco Harris. On 50 carries, Harris was held to just three yards a rush by Jones and quick pursuing Randy White, number 54, who also collapsed the pocket of Terry Bradshaw. Nowhere was this twosome more fearsome than in Super Bowl XII against the Denver Broncos. Morton play action, back to pass. Fires it out and it's intercepted again. Mark Washington to the 40, to the 50. I'll tell you why that ball was intercepted, because Ed Jones was all over Craig Morton like ugly on an ape, as they used to say when I was in school. 
1974, quarterback Craig Morton, number seven, was traded away from Dallas for a number one draft pick. Ironically, that choice turned out to be Randy White. White pounded and pounded the Bronco quarterback and was named co-MVP of the game. The Cowboys' victory in Super Bowl XII was a tribute to two players who were as versatile as they were violent. Here's Hayes' kickoff. Waiting back deep, Fulton Walker. He's Against Washington, Miami's Fulton Walker became the first man in Super Bowl history to return a kickoff for a touchdown. 40-yard line, 40-yard line, he's gone! It's a touchdown! A 98-yard kickoff return for a touchdown for the Miami Dolphins! Never in a Super Bowl has anyone ever taken a punt back the distance. Although dream team return man John Taylor of San Francisco certainly came the closest. And the left-footed kicker drives it. Oh, this is a dandy. Taylor having to run for this ball. It bounces past him. Goes to the 15. Goes to the 10. He picks it up. Gets away from man. Gets away from another. Gets away from another. Comes to the 30. He is the man. Quiet man of this football team, Scott Norwood. He can fire the shot heard round the world now. Here we go with eight seconds to play. High drama here in the Super Bowl. Snap. Spot. In the air. It's got the distance. It is... Into the peaks and valley world of the Super Bowl kickers strode a young man more suited for the ups and downs of the ski slope, Kansas City's Jan Stenerud. I was, uh, as you may know, I had a ski scholarship at Montana State University. I was recruited as a ski jumper. I was one of the most promising ski jumpers in, in Norway. Got a ski scholarship, and my junior year at Montana State, I was running the stadium steps every day in the fall to get ready for the ski season. And I thought, I think I'll try to kick that football. And I lined up and I hit a few. The basketball coach, Roger Kraft, walks across the field and he watches me, runs back to the football coach, Jim Sweeney, and says, this Norwegian ski jumper is kicking the hell out of the football. That's how I got started. I forgot all about it. A few days later, I'm running the steps again and Sweeney yells at me, get down here. Tease the ball up for me. The whole team is watching. I'm nervous. Kick off about four or five times and one or two of them go through the goalpost. Uh, somebody informed me that was pretty good. Hey, hey, we, go, we don't give them anything, man. We keep pouring that pressure on, putting the coal in the fire. Kick it up high, Jan. Let's go. Come on. No frozen rope. Get it up in the air so we can cover this thing, all right? Let's go. Jan Stenerud put his best foot forward in Super Bowl IV. Against the Vikings, Stenerud got three chances to split him, and he was perfect all three times. Each time Hank Stram called on him, Jan put up the critical points. Field goal! Stenerud's crowning achievement was a 48-yarder, the longest field goal in the first 25 years of Super Bowl play. That's a good start. That's a good start, a good kick. away. Yeah, that's it. All right. Stenerud was cool in the clutch. But seven years later, Dream Team punter Ray Guy experienced a Super Bowl nightmare. It is blocked. It's blocked by Fred McNeil. It's loose on the five-yard line. Running after the Minnesota Vikings. They down it on the Raider two-yard line. And Raymond Guy has suffered his first block punt in a four-year pro career. For Ray Guy, the blocked punt was an aberration, a quirk during a smooth, almost machine-like professional and Super Bowl career. Guy didn't just punt the ball. He blasted Pete Rozelle's autograph into uncharted galaxies. He is the dream team punter and, amazingly, the most valuable player in Raider history. If I were to pick one player that would get the adulation, 
and the nod of all of our past great players, and no one would be offended. Perhaps I could say uh, uh, the greatest punter who ever played the game, Ray Guy, our number one draft choice many years ago from Southern Mississippi, who just retired. Ray Guy would be someone that everyone could nod their head and say, uh, gee, uh, that's a good choice, coach. That's a good choice. Whether it be the preseason, week six, or the Super Bowl, it is in the pits where the outcome is settled. The Super Bowl Dream Team offensive line consists of five veteran pounders. Packers to the right, Raiders to the left, and Pittsburgh's Iron Mike Webster, square in the middle. He was like the quarterback, the leader of, uh, of the whole offensive unit, the offensive line. Uh, I think a lot of people are not aware of what kind of responsibility the center does have in calling the blocking assignments, first recognizing the defense and then calling the blocking assignments for each of the individuals, each of the five on the offensive line, sometimes even the tight end. Certainly no one was ever better than Mike Webster at number one, recognizing, and number two is the leadership that he portrayed throughout those years. Mike Webster quarterbacked Pittsburgh's undersized, trapping front wall throughout their dynasty. And of all the great plays that brought them rings, one stands out. I think the one that really sticks in my mind is uh, the third down trap, uh, tackle trap we ran against Dallas in the Super Bowl. Franco busted it, I think, for 22 yards and a touchdown. I think uh, when you score on a long run, it's a little more satisfying than scoring on a long pass. Green Bay's Jerry Kramer and Forrest Gregg are a formidable dream team duo. The tandem of Forrest Gregg and Jerry Kramer together, both of them gifted athletes. They had the advantage of staying together a long time. And they also had the advantage of uh, being students of one of the great teachers of all time, that of course, Vince Lombardi. I don't, I don't think that I ever saw anybody who had a more thorough knowledge not just of where the play should be run and how the block should be executed, but every little detail. Lombardi had that ability to teach, and they had the ability to take advantage of, of his knowledge. Greg number 75 and Kramer number 64 were larger than life, as was the famed Packer sweep, Lombardi, and all of title time. I think there was an element of uh, strangeness, the aura that surrounded the Packers at that time probably scared Kansas City and Oakland both. I don't think they had seen anybody like that. I think fear certainly was, a, was part of it, just the invincibility that uh, they sort of portrayed to whomever they played. And the fact that they were just very talented was the other part of it. Kramer and Greg helped sweep the Packers to easy wins. And a decade later, the Vikings were blown away in Super Bowl XI, more specifically, blown away by the left side of Oakland's offensive line. Number 88, Alan Page, was one victim, a Hall of Famer who faced Oakland's cat-quick left guard Gene Upshaw, number 63. A classic individual Super Bowl matchup, Page versus Upshaw. Alan and I came in the league together. We're very good friends off the field. And uh, on Sunday, when that game starts, I won't have any use for him. I'm try to tear his head off. Next to Page stood number 70, Jim Marshall, who weighed but 240 pounds, 60 pounds less than Raider Man Mountain, Art Shell, number 78. Jim Marshall, who I, who I have a lot of respect for, there's no way in the world I'm supposed to lose that battle. If I'm a 300 pounder and this guy's weighing 240 pounds, I shouldn't lose that battle. And um, I didn't go in the game disrespecting him, but I just knew what kind of talent I had and what kind of talent the rest of the guys on the line had. On game day, I turned to Gene and I said, the Vikings don't know what they're in for today. We had to control the line of scrimmage. That was the Raiders, power football. We were, we were gonna knock them off the ball. Raiders dominated from start to finish, pouring over, around, and behind Shell and Upshaw, back after back, 
first down after first down in a relentless left-handed barrage of power punches. Bannon side, the ball got in, first down. Holy Toledo, the Oakland line is just wiping out Minnesota's front. Art Shell had been a basketball player, an excellent basketball player. Gene Upshaw could do anything athletically. They were big, they were solid, they were really outstanding athletes. For big offensive linemen, these were athletes. And so it went for 60 unrelenting minutes. Upshaw shoving Page aside, Shell not allowing Marshall a single tackle, as the Raiders proved that might makes right winning their first Super Bowl in a dominant show of force. Super! All right, no, no way they can stop us. We had a solid football. That's all it is. Solid. Solid football. Super! Bronco receiver Ricky Natil's date with destiny came on Denver's first offensive play in Super Bowl XXII. Coming, Natil catches it for a touchdown! 56-yard touchdown pass, out away to Natil! First Bronco play, Spartino three to go in the first quarter. Fortune smiled on Green Bay's Max McGee, who came off the bench to score the first touchdown in Super Bowl history. Fate determined that Super Bowl X would be the stage for the first and only touchdown catch for Cowboy Percy Howard. For Baltimore's Jimmy Orr, number 28, destiny never called, and some say his ghost still runs free and forgotten to this day down in an empty orange bowl. Fate has been especially fickle for Super Bowl tight ends. It's third down and three, Dallas at the Pittsburgh 10. Roger back to throw, has a man open in the end zone, caught, touchdown, drop! Dropped Jackie in the Smith. end zone, Jackie Smith all by himself. Oh, bless his heart, he's got to be the sickest man in America. Oh, Jackie was so wide open in the end zone, it was incredible. Unlike Smith, Cincinnati's Dan Ross held on to 11 passes, a Super Bowl record. And in Super Bowl V, the outcome of a John Unitas pass seemed predestined as it caromed off the fingertips of Eddie Hinton and Mel Renfro before coming to rest in the arms of Big John Mackey. Super Bowl seemed to possess an unpredictable rhythm, but playing in harmony with the erratic beat came naturally for the Dream Team receivers. The tight end always marched to a different drummer. If you're going to be a great football player, you're going to be a little weird. I know I was motivated to try and be good, but um, how I was perceived, uh, I think I like to be perceived as anything but a football player, and I don't know why. Dave Casper was all football player in Super Bowl XI, as he helped Oakland roll over Minnesota 32-14. to 14. Dave Casper was a classic because he had been an all-American offensive lineman. When we took him in the second round, everyone said, well, you know, he's too slow for tight end. You're going to make a guard out of him. We said, no, we're going to make him faster and keep him a tight end. He was ideal for us because he could put his helmet in anybody and block him. But he could get downfield through intelligent releases and intelligent route running and a little more speed than people thought he had. And the fact that defensive backs did not want to get in his way too often. In 1976, Casper caught more passes than any other tight end and he added four more and a touchdown in the Raiders' first Super Bowl victory. The ghost, in many ways, was a reluctant hero who stood tall and answered destiny's call. For the leading vote-getter at wide receiver, fate found him the very day he was born. First, you have to get the right name to be graceful, okay? You, you have to be born a swan. Okay? I mean, it's, <laughs> I couldn't invent that. You've got to be born with a good name that says that you're graceful. A true star was born in Super Bowl X, as Lynn Swan danced across the Orange Bowl floor in a masterful performance. 
phenomenal uh, leaping ability, uncanny uh, uh, ability to make impossible catches. His play in Super Bowl X, where he's out of bounds, catches the ball, and it seems like he has somebody up there pushing him back in bounds and then touches down. And then the one-handed grab and then fall and catch it while the guy's all over me. You just don't see people make those kinds of catches. Swan's acrobatics awed all who watched. But it was his clutch 64-yard fourth-quarter touchdown that won the game for Pittsburgh. People will make other spectacular catches. They'll be game-winning catches. But Super Bowl X, that Sunday, that was my day, forever. Swan rose above Dallas once more three years later. And Swan makes his circus catch in the end zone. Unbelievable catch for the touchdown. He looked like a flying circus, and the Southern Cal Flyer pulled it in. Holy smoke. He soared over the Rams in the finale finishing with a Super Bowl record 364 total receiving yards. One yard more than Jerry Rice. Not born to greatness, but one whose hard work took him to Pro Football Summit. First of all, I, uh, I went to work with my father, and he was a bricklayer. And my role was to uh, catch the bricks. And at times, uh, my father tossed two bricks up, and they would separate, and I would have to snatch them out of air. And I think that really helped me out. And during the summer, we would go out and just run down some horses. You know, they was in this big pasture and uh, really difficult to, uh, to catch, and we would run them down. At times, it would take maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and we would just uh, run them down. Black 59, Razor! Black 59, Razor! In Super Bowl 24, Jerry Rice buried Denver with his boundless talents. He has two, two of the greatest abilities I think there is, is the, his ability to get by a defender and also his ability after the catch to make people miss and turn a small play into a big game. The Broncos were crushed as Rice caught seven passes for 148 yards and three touchdowns. You never see him stumble or fall or stretch out or lay out. He has that ability to run underneath the ball and catch it on a dead run, dead stride, and never slow down. Ball's there, he runs through it, and he seems to accelerate. And when he catches it, he's going full speed. When you see Jerry Rice flow the length of a field like hot oil on a slanted pane of glass, that's not natural talent. He is a combination of hard work, tremendous pride, and determination. When the ball is in the air, I focus in on the football. I hear of nothing. I just try to just lock in on the football and just block everything out. My job is to make plays. I think I play my best football when everything is on the line. 49ers have to go to the 25 for a first down. They're at the 45. Montana back to throw. Throws over the middle. A five In Super Bowl 23, brilliant catches were the order of the day for Rice, the game's most valuable player. He tied a Super Bowl record with 11 catches, set a new standard with 215 receiving yards, and was Joe Montana's main man in San Francisco's third world championship. He's back to throw, quick pass for Rice, got it out of bounds! Casper, Swan, and Rice. When destiny called, they answered.
for NFL head coaches. Winning a Super Bowl is the ultimate achievement. In 25 years of competition, just 14 men have experienced this exhilaration. Six lucky men have lived this moment twice. San Francisco's Bill Walsh was swept away three times during his distinguished career. Pittsburgh's Chuck Knoll has conquered a record four Super Bowl foes. Their reward? A silver trophy. Bearing the name of a coach whose accomplishments set the standard by which all members of the profession are measured. Everybody grabbing out there. Nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. Vince Lombardi's will to win was like a fire. His words, the smoldering embers that fueled Green Bay's greatness. Winning is not the most important thing, it is the only thing. What he really meant by that was that the will to win is the most important thing. While striving for perfection, you may achieve excellence along the way. He always said if you have character, that he could bring it out of you. And if you didn't, that you wouldn't be in Green Bay. Coach Lombardi used to say that there are three important things in your life. Your God, your family, and the Green Bay Packers. He taught us about commitment. He taught us about consistency. He taught us about preparation. He taught us about the price you have to pay to win. And I think everybody on the football team bought his philosophy. The first Super Bowl was, of course, the first confrontation between the AFL and the NFL, and there was a great deal of pressure on Coach Lombardi by the other owners in the NFL, not only beat Kansas City, but beat them badly. Lombardi's legions clearly met their mandate. One year later, in Super Bowl II, Green Bay's motivation was even greater. We had all been pretty aware of the fact that Coach Lombardi was thinking very, very seriously about retirement. And uh, I said to the fellows, I said, look, we got 30 more minutes this year. I said, let's give it to the old man. Let's play the last 30 for the old man. That's about all I said. Vince Lombardi, the greatest head coach in NFL history, was also the fans' choice as the finest coach in 25 years of Super Bowls. I'd just like to say that uh, I'm real pleased with, with everything, and uh, I'm very, very, very grateful, really, believe me. I think they got a great bunch of boys, and they certainly deserve uh, what they got. Upon his death in 1970, his name became a permanent part of football's greatest game. Lombardi's first lieutenant was quarterback Bart Starr. In Super Bowls I and II, Starr ran the Packer offense with polish and poise. His passes earned him the most valuable player award in both contests. In Super Bowl III, Joe Namath's inspired leadership guided the New York Jets to the biggest upset in the game's history and made Broadway Joe the MVP. One year later, it was Kansas City's Lenny Dawson. Go ahead, go ahead for Mike, Len Lenny Dawson. The most valuable, valuable player, player, player in Super Bowl Kansas, 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 Kansas City, Kansas City. Lenny, Dawson. Lenny Dawson. Nice going, Lenny. Nice going, baby. Nice going, baby. In all, Nine quarterbacks have won this award. You talk about the Super Bowl, you can read about it, you can watch it on television. So you step out on that field, you have no earthly idea of how important that game is to you. When you step out on that field, all of a sudden it dawns on you. This is a serious um, buck right here. This sucker big anything I ever thought it was. 
And then the next thing hits your mind is, God, I'd, I'd hate to lose this. <laughs> God, to lose one of these? Can you imagine what that'd be like? That was always the greatest fear. Like Bradshaw, San Francisco's Joe Montana has won four Super Bowls, displaying a brand of icy poise in this big game pressure cooker that inspires admiration. I think Mike Holmgren, who's the offensive coordinator for the 49ers, described Montana to me better than anybody else before they beat Denver in the Super Bowl in New Orleans. I remember on Thursday before the game, we were riding back from practice, and he was talking about uh, Montana's ability to pick up secondary receivers. And he said, most quarterbacks can see two, perhaps, sometimes three. My guy, meaning Montana, can see all five. And he said, if the Denver people don't change their defensive scheme by the time the game comes on Sunday, then my guy, meaning Montana, will just eat them up. And he did, as you recall. His record-breaking MVP performance in Super Bowl XXIV offered a fitting climax to a championship story begun back in Super Bowl XVI. There, at the tender age of 25, he passed the 49ers to victory and won his first Most Valuable Player award. Three years later, he outdueled Dan Marino for MVP award number two. it was in the closing minutes of game 23 that his cold-blooded concentration passed into legend. He came into the huddle and I was like yelling and screaming, come on, let's go. Uh, this is the biggest drive of my life. Uh, if we want the ring, we've got to go out and get it. And he looked at me and it was during one of those long TV timeouts they had in the Super Bowl and he looked at me and goes, hey H, you know, that's what he calls me, Harris, H, hey H, check it out. I go, what? And he goes, hey, look over there in that, in that end zone. And I looked there. He goes, hey, there's John Candy. And I go, John Candy? And sure enough, John Candy's sitting there eating some popcorn. And I, and I look at him, and I look at the clock, and you know, there's you know, three minutes to go in the game, the biggest game of the year. And he's so relaxed that and then all of a sudden the TV timeout ended. And next thing I know, we're marching down the field for the winning drive. Joe back to throw, steps up, throws, out here for Rice. He has it. Midfield goes out of bounds at about the 40 seconds. Montana back to throw. Joe Montana collected more votes at quarterback than all the other candidates combined. At the 10 yard line, 39 seconds remaining. Montana at quarterback, in motion, comes right. Back to throw Montana. Stepped up, throws. Four Super Bowl appearances, 11 touchdown passes without an interception a record three Most Valuable Player Awards, the all-time Super Bowl Dream Team quarterback.